and welcome to Grandmaster's Choice. I'm Grandmaster Dennis Borosh. And today, actually, we're going to look at a special opening. So I tell you that there was an opening invented six years ago. Six. So not that long ago. 2014, to be more exact. And there are two people who were among the inventors. One of them is surprisingly Rockport Richard and Baadur Jobava. So you guessed it. We're going to talk about the Rockport Jobava variation. And for us to really understand the nitty gritty of this opening, we should look at the game that started it all. And that game is between Richard Rapport and Emil Sutovsky in the Olympiad. So, d4, knight f6, knight c3. I still have to stop in this moment because after d5, bishop f4, you're actually playing with the black, with the white pieces. I know that sounds shocking at first glance, but hear me out. So, d4, d5, c4, knight c6. This is well known to be the Chigorin defense which Chigorin loved playing and later on picked up by such legends as Morozevich and other very good and aggressive players such as Richard Rapport. So figuring that, hey, if I'm playing this system with d4, knight f6, knight c3, d5, what if I play bishop f4? And the difference is kind of striking. Actually, white is playing a Chigorin up a tempo. They were wondering, hmm, would this actually give me a chance to get better as white? So, as Richard Rapport and his future wife started experimenting with this, but the big and acid test came at the Tromsø Olympiad, where actually he gave it a go. So let's see how it goes. C5, this is the real challenging try, what Sutovsky plays. He's trying to kind of pick at the center. E3, C takes D4, E takes D4. And I wonder, what would be your first thought? What would be the move that you would like to play here with black? I know you might be a little bit unfamiliar with this position, but I really like be, I'd really be curious to know what you think should be the best move here with black. Don't forget, development is important. However, surprising as it may seem, development here is losing on the spot. Knight c6, which wasn't played, is actually losing. So you're lost on move 5. How good an opening can be with white where you actually win in 5 moves? And I'm going to show you why. This bishop already was covering the c7 square. Since the c-pawn is gone and the knight can't cover that c7 anymore from a6, the knight b5 jump actually is coming with full power. If queen a5 check, you're just blocked. And you can't really capture that knight because this bishop is defending it. So knight c7 is coming, fork down, and it's game over. The only thing that you can do is play e5, but then d takes e5, and you're going to lose one more pawn. And being up two pawns in the opening is not such a bad deal. And that is kind of one of those little tricks of the Rapport Jabava. Not only can you win in five moves, you also get tricky options. So a6 obviously was played by Emil Sutovsky, stopping this knight b5 move. Knight f3. Now, there, apart from the positives, like these knight b5 tricks, which makes this kind of a fun variation, there's a little bit of a downside. Because there's no more tension in the center anymore, 
the play becomes a little bit dry. But you're going to see how Rockport treats this position like it's the sharpest Sicilian you've ever seen. So Sutovsky realizing that this bishop is doing absolutely nothing. You play the bishop g4. Also, if you play knight c6, then there's knight e5, and no longer can you pin the knight. Therefore, Sutovsky played bishop g4 instead. And here comes the big move, h3. He's not hesitating. Richard is not hesitating here. He's asking where your bishop is going. If you go bishop h5, you do run into g4 and knight e5, and that bishop just doesn't feel comfortable, and oftentimes h4 can be very powerful. So if black plays e6, immediately you can play h4, and white just is going to ruin black's structure, and is on the verge of getting a big advantage. So seeing this, Sutovsky took on f3, Queen f3, knight c6, and if you can predict the next move based on the identity of the white player, what would that move be? What is the big move? Long castles. And that is one of those staple Rapport type of play. He always goes for the jugular. He's a very aggressive player and plays this Rapport Jabava system like it's a Chigorin up a tempo. E6, G4. And I'm mentioning it because Jabava's style is a little bit different. Now, he's also an aggressive player, but he can mix it up, as we will see in the upcoming games. Bishop b4. Now, on the surface, this looks very dangerous for the white king. Knight e2. And Sutovsky actually falls for the bait, and he's trying to be very aggressive and tries to tag those queenside pawns. King b1, knight e4, and it looks very dangerous. However, Rockport's next move, a la Bent Larsen, will defend everything and there'll be no more problems in this position for white. So oftentimes the a pawn can be a problem, but if white can over defend on the queen side, then it'll be okay. c3 would actually weaken these pawns. So just keep one thing in mind. Once you move a pawn in front of your king, it's much, much easier to attack you. Let's say you play a3, bishop b7. You can often get hit by b5, b4. And that's something you don't want to see. And that'll be a problem. And black can get the big attack going. And the big move is knight c1. Very similar to Bent Larsen's knight f8 defensive idea. After knight c1, you cannot be checkmated, or at least it's very difficult to get mated. Note, even if you go knight c3, that's not a big deal. You can capture, and the knight will always be ready there to hop. So the only threat here would be getting the, the queen to b2, because there is no threats on the a2 pawn whenever you have a knight on c1. So there's just rook d3, and this bishop will have to leave. Actually, knight b3 is probably much more simple, and simpler because you don't have queen a3. Because there's queen takes c3, long range move, but wins the game. So seeing that there's no way he can break through, he gave the option of exchanging the bishop. So bishop d6, however, knight b3 was played, queen c7, and bishop e3. Again, a very stylish move by Richard, as he's aiming to keep his vice alive, that bishop pair. If you would have taken on d6, queen d6, and this knight is a monster, 
And also, because of the closed nature of the position, you can't really do anything or do too much. So bishop e3 is a better move, keeping the tension, and hopes to get the bishop to d3. But let's stop here just for a second. In order to understand an opening, you've got to understand the ideas. So if we look at this position, what do you think will be the long-term plan for white in this, position, in this specific case? Which side of the board are we going to play at? Queen side, king side? Pawn storm on the king side, I see. Yep. We're going to play on the king side because we have more pawns and already a g4 pawn kind of grabbing space. So it's just logical that we're going to go in that direction. And Sotovsky makes a typical move of castling, which is normal in a Sicilian. However, you really need to focus whenever your opponent pawns are ready to attack with g5 and h4. You should think twice if you just castle into the attack, as so we say. Rook g1. Just getting ready to pounce, just like a bull seeing a red flag. b5, bishop d3. Little moves, but first, Rapport knows to connect the rooks, so there's no disharmony between the pieces. Also, he makes sure that there's enough pressure on that knight. So could have tried g5, but then maybe that would run into f5, and it's not that clear yet. And if you go back knight f6, then I can go g5, knight d7, h4, and who's faster? Obviously, it's white. Those pawns are very fast, and they're roaming down the board. But Sutovsky is known to be a fighter, just like Rapport, and he says, no, I'm gonna fight. I'm gonna play f5, bolster this knight on e4, and everything's a great. However, it turns out that this was too much, and it's Rapport to move and show some fantastic technical, tactical vision, that is. He is going to show some fantastic tactical vision. Obviously, we're going to take here. If rook takes f5, you do run into queen g2, and there are many problems. He takes f5. We're getting closer to Rapport's magnificent sacrifice. So it's white to move and crash through. Yep, we've got to go bishop h6, we've got to put pressure on the king, and that's very logical. If your opponent's king is just a little bit exposed, you've got to all the way and just attack. Rook f7. Seemingly everything's all right. But here comes the punch. Here comes the big punchline. Boom! Bishop takes g7. Out of the blue, he sacrifices the bishop because he notices one little detail. Rook takes, queen takes f5. So let me start with the count. Rapport has two pawns for a piece which is not like full compensation. However, he already has his rooks ready to double on the g-file and there are many loose pieces. So that rook is a little bit loose, 
if it gets exposed, it might be won by the queen. And even queen d5 is threatening to take not just the pawn, but the e4 knight. So the third pawn is hanging and the attack is still raging. So knight e7 is a possible move. However, this runs into <clears throat> queen e6 check. Here, rook takes, king takes, check again. And if you go in the corner, there's... A simple but elegant solution here. So let's try to find it. The king is already in big, big trouble. It's cornered. One check can ruin the whole day for the black armada. Bishop takes. Eliminating this knight which defended the f6 square after d, queen f6 checkmates. So knight e7, probably the most natural possible move here, is failing because of that queen e6 takes takes rook g1 and bishop e4 idea. So Sutovsky is hiding. He is going to hide instead. So knowing what we already know, we should be able to find the next move. Remember, the d5 pawn is super weak, but if you can combine it with an attack, it will be even more successful. Well, if you take the knight, it's a different situation because black still has coordination in his position. That rook is well defended and rook g8 is coming. So if you're not careful, Sutovsky will wriggle out. Rook takes g7. Why? Because he would be happy to see king takes check here and bishop takes c4 with the same idea. However, if you take with the queen, as happened in the game, because... Sutovsky just doesn't have a better choice. Then we have queen takes d5. And there's a big difference. In the other case, if you take now, this knight is defended by the queen. So black can go knight f6 and just attack the queen. However, after rook takes, queen takes, queen takes d5, the queen is hitting a jackpot as it not only hits the knight on c6, it kind of x-rays through to a8 and e4 as well. So rook takes g7 is by all means the best move trying to discoordinate Sutovsky's pieces. Knight takes f2, queen takes c6. And this is kind of typical rapport sharp calculation. You thought you could win that rook, however, you really can't because that a8 rook is hanging and then there's just too many pawns dropping. Let's say here, takes, and you don't really have this check, which would be nice, playing for back rank, because after bc, check, white can just go king b2 and there's no checkmate. So here, Sutovsky's uh, agony is just starting, plays rook f8. So white can still take on d6 because the d1 rook is hanging just to do something else, plays rook c1, but let's just pawn, uh, start counting pawns. So according to the pawn counts, white has two extra pawns. That's not a bad thing, and we're just on move 25. That's not a bad result against Emil Sutovsky, who's 26-24 at the time. So a very strong grandmaster. Having a winning position, after 25 moves, is a wonderful accomplishment. Knight d3, cd, queen g3. However, he did succeed in creating a double pawns. The problem is not only you're down two pawns, your king is just awful in the corner. a3, saying, hey, you can take the pawn, but at least I can hide my king away and then I'll start K 
capturing and going all Pac-Man on your pawns on a6 and b5. Bishop f4, rook d1, queen h3, knight c5. Just activating the knight, defending that pawn on d3, which was kind of loose before. Bishop e3, queen e4. And actually, Richard is showing something that's very important. Even when you have a winning position, the basic chess principles should guide you. So he activates the knight that is on c5 on a beautiful outpost, while queen e4 is also lording down the board in the middle of the board, namely the center. So no wonder that he's near winning in this position. Queen f3. So Sotovsky seeing that there's danger, big danger in the position. He's aiming to exchange off the pieces. Queen e5 check. But obviously, Rapport doesn't want any of that. Why? Because takes, takes. Then the h-pawn can run down on the board and it can get double-edged. Queen e5, king g8, rook e1. Also, he notices that his king is just way better than Sutovsky's on g8. Bishop f2, rook e4, queen f5, queen c7. Still no exchanges, even threatening to double on the 7th. King h8, knight e6, rook g8, d5, bishop h4, queen c5. Again, centralizing. Everything centralized, making sure everything is defended. Bishop f6, king a2. Look at that. All of white pieces are defending each other, apart from the d pawn, but it's very hard to get close to that one h5, rook f4, queen g6, d6, and after queen d5 ideas, this d pawn can start rushing, so this is kind of the beginning of the end. Bishop g7, so this time, Rapport changes pace, plays queen f5, because he's actually hoping just to promote, so by now, the pawn has moved from d4 to d6, and that means it's just two moves away from queening. So he says, okay, in this case, I'm happy to exchange queens. King h7, d7, and because this f6 square is guarded by the queen and the rook, there's no way of stopping that promotion. Queen takes, rook takes f5, king g6, and the icing of the cake is the last move that Richard Rapport played. So channel your inner Richard Rapport and you'll find this beautiful finishing touch. Why to move and win the game? Well, elegance is an attitude. And Rook F8 was played. Beautiful, beautiful solution. The point is, either you're going to lose that rook, or if you take, then I can just promote on d8, and I'm up a queen, there's no hope there. And if you takes, knight takes, and queens. So after rook f8, Sutovsky resigned. Not a bad start for this fledgling opening of the Robert Jobava system or variation. It's a good start, but let's get going to the next one. So let's take a look now how Mr. Badur Jobava plays this system. How he does and plays. And in this game, he's facing the world champion Veselin Topalov. Knight f6, knight c3, d5, bishop f4, e6. Now e6 is the other move, but obviously c5 is the critical, but we've already touched upon this one in the most important game, Rapport Sutovsky. e6, knight b5. And if you can forgive me, 
I'm going to show a counterpart of this one. So in the Reiti, there's this system of d5, g3, knight c6, d4, bishop f5, and all of these ideas obviously was, by, was sprung by Richard Rapport, and in fact, with the help of his, Fresine bit Kramnik. So bishop f5, bishop g2, knight b4, and this is a typical idea which was kind of picked up later on by Caruana and, of course, Morozevich, who's a Chigorin player. Now remember, if you just rotate the board, this is actually very much the same as we're going to see in this game. So let's go back. Knight c3, d5, e6, knight b5. Exactly the same thing. So the whole point of knight b5 is the following. He's attacking the c-pawn. If you play bishop d6, you lose your bishop pair, which is clear, would favor white. So knight a6 is virtually the only move defending the pawn, but then you can argue that this knight is going to look very dumb in the future on a6. a3, c6, knight c3. So even though Jobava's knight on c3 is not ideal, well, what can we say about that knight on a6 then? Well, what we can say that knight on a6 is horrible. Bishop d6, e3. So this is kind of the slower way of playing this system. Why not c4? Because white is actually not equipped for quick action. Because this king is still in some sort of dangers of checks. So after you play c4, you no longer have this move of c3. So bishop b4 check can be very dangerous because the only move you can play there is either bishop d2 or back, but even that can run into knight e4 with uncomfortable complications. So a3 is actually an important move, stopping that bishop b4 idea. And now knight c3 is a possibility. Bishop d6, e3. And I was about to tell you that. So, Rapport is the more aggressive type in the Rapport Jabava system slash variation. However, Jabava sometimes like to play it like it's more of a QGD, so a Queen's Gambit type of position. Knight c7, knight f3. So what Jabava claims in this position is the following. I have the e5 control, and your knight is not very well placed on c7. Bishop f4, e takes f4. Now bishop takes f4 makes sense, however, it gives away this all-important e5 square, which, as we will see in the game, will have a negative effect on Topalov's position. Queen d6. I don't know if I even have to ask you what you should be playing in this position, but I'm going to do it anyways. So what should we react? Black is bothering our pawns on f4. How should we deal with this mortal question? Well, we should always play like a boss, like Joe Bava would. And obviously he plunked that knight on e5. And that is not just a measly knight. It's a knight that's supported by two pawns. So that is a powerful outpost right there. b6, just hoping to do some exchanges in the future and just activate that in general miserable bishop on c8. And that's actually one of the reasons why this system can be very dangerous uh, for black because that c8 bishop still has a long way to go till it gets active. Queen f3, c5, and Jabava's next move is kind of more aggressive than good. So here he could have just gone castling or rook d1. Both of them are fine. However, both Rapport and Jabava are concrete players. They like to go for action. So he played knight b5. And I'm not claiming that this is the best move, 
but it does provide many practical problems, pose many of those problems for Topalov. Note that the king is still in the center and a move away from castling. However, Jobava is going to try to capitalize on that. Takes, takes, bishop d7, knight takes d7, knight takes d7, and long castle. So yes, Badur is thinking about taking on d7, but not just yet. He's waiting if Topalov is going to react to the fact that this pin is sort of annoying. Because even if Topalov plays a6 now, that is sort of a success from Jabava's perspective, because he could go dc, bc, and c4, immediately hacking away and attacking the d5 pawn. So oftentimes, when these super grandmasters don't take pieces, they just want to provoke you to waste time, or play moves such as a6. But Topalov, as we all know, is a legend, and he's not going to waste time on that. Bishop takes d7, queen takes d7, and Jobova, realizing that king can be very dangerous in this case, because in the previous case, black did not really have time to consolidate. So if you would take on c5, c4, that would be very dicey in this position. So let's try to find Jobava's next move, which will try to chip away from the center. So even though this position might seem a little bit slow, it's not. If black starts rolling in two moves, we can get in trouble. So as white, you've got to be very aggressive and be on point. So whoever said f5, congratulations, f5 is the big move here. Why? Because if you take on f5, d takes c5, bc, and I can take with the queen or the rook, it kind of depends on my or your style. I could go rook d5, try to win this pawn, or go queen d5. In both cases, White will have a very nice advantage. The king is already on the right side of the board where there's a potential for a pass pawn. So this is just ideal for an endgame. Now, Topalov obviously is not rooting for the white pieces, so he's going to avoid that. Plays queen e7, a natural move, sidestepping pressure. However, Rook h e1 shows up, simple and strong. And sometimes in chess, you don't necessarily need to make astounding moves, just moves that follow chess principles. Bringing in your rook that did nothing in the corner. Simple, just improve it and your situation will get better. Again, if you would get greedy, which in chess isn't necessarily a bad thing, you'd face the same exact problem. You might lose some more pawns, and we get this position right again. The power of centralization. And actually, that's why I kind of adhere to this Rapport Jabava variation, because it kind of shows you that you need to centralize. And if you do, then you'll reap the rewards, as you'll see in this game. Rook e1, c takes d4. Rook takes d4, queen f6. So black actually managed to keep it intact so far. Queen f4, just defending this rook. However, queen f4 was a little bit dangerous. Why? Because you do allow some sort of ideas of e5. Not quite yet though, because I have two pieces covering the e5 square. So naturally, Topalov plays rook e8 setting up e5. But Jobava is not having any of that. Plays rook e5 and says, no, you're not gonna play it. Not today, at least. Rook e5 and you can see that white has some nice little pressure here. And for a second, let's start thinking strategically. 
So, if black does nothing, what would be white's big plan in this position? Nimzo would indeed be very proud. This is the perfect blockade. You would start roaming with g4, g5. Indeed, warriors, it is Badur Jobava, the legendary player. Yeah, so in this specific case, even though black has a solid structure, he has no real plans or aggressive plans. So you can go g4, g5, and then there'll be issues. As the attack will start rolling, and once the f5 pawn reaches f6, mate is not far away. So noticing that Topalov went into e takes f5, rook takes d5, rook e5, rook e5, g6, but then we kind of get a typical Sicilian situation where white has an extra pawn on the queen side. And the king, that will be much, much closer to those passers than this king on g8, which is oceans away. Probably on a different continent. On g8. Rook e2. So, mission accomplished, says Jabava. I have the position that I wanted to get. So I'm just going to drop back. Defend my second rank. My queen is also ready to pounce on c7 and just go and bother those pawns on a7 and b6. Rook d8, queen e5. And these are those little details that makes these grandmasters so good. They notice, they notice that the endgame is perfect for me. So, queen exchange? How about exchanging queens? Top Topalov is asked that question from Jabava. However, Veselin Topalov is saying, no, 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 no. Your king is really good in the endgame. However, we're still in the middle game, and I want to checkmate that folk on c1. So if I can still keep the queen on the board, bother maybe your kingside pawns, I might get some counter chances. So to be honest with you, this position is probably balanced, but it's not a draw. Why? Because if white does manage to exchange off the queens, white will get the advantage because he will have more potential to create a passer. What about black? Well, black has the chance to put pressure on these pawns or create some threats against the king. And let's see what happened. F3, just defending all these pawns, making sure Veselin doesn't have any funny business going on. A5, b3, b5, king b2. So, b3, king b2, by the way, was prepared well in advance by Jabava. If you would have done that earlier, this would be checkmate. So, you can tell how dangerous this can be. You can get made in one move if the move order is wrong. So, queen e5 was important. Queen c6, f3, a5, b3, and he's just building a little cave for that king on b2. King b2, a4. Does white really want the position to open up in front of the king? Not at all. So he's going to play b4. Queen c4, and probably queen c4 was a little bit overzealous by the world champion, ex world champion, from this moment. If, because we're talking from 2020, as Magnus is the reigning champion right now. He should have gone rook c8 instead and put pressure on the c-file. Not that he's going to get an advantage, but probably he has enough counterplay on this king that the position still keeps being balanced. However, queen c4 is a going a little bit overboard. He's trying to get behind the white pieces and try to smoke out the king on b2. Rook e3. And this is kind of those cheeky moves by Jobava. He's saying, okay, go ahead. Go ahead in there. I don't believe that's such a big danger. Queen f1. Rook e2. 
saying the queen is actually misplaced on f1. It does not that much. Rook d1. Boom takes the pawn and says, hey, I will hide my king on c3. And your king, on the other hand, is without any defenders. The whole army of yours is still on the back rank. King c3, king g7. Rook e1 actually, which seems kind of dangerous, could run into this nice little move of rook e8 check. And you can't quite capture it because the queen would be lost on f1. So Topalov decides to flee with his monarch. King g7, check. Queen e3, king g7. And we already know what we're supposed to do as white. We're up a pawn, and endgame would be brilliant. So can you guess what Badur played in this position? Once you know the goal of the game, it's much, much easier to find the moves. Yes, of course, queen f2, cheekily offering the exchange of queens, and in that case, this b-pawn, with the help of the king, and that's what I was talking about. This king is just much stronger than its counterpart. It's just ready to support this pawn on b4. So like here, here, I can go b5, and when you come closer, I'll cut you off. And you can't come closer. And this king will win the game alone together with that pawn. So queen h1, obviously Topalov wants none of that. But then this queen is very awkward in that corner. Queen d4, king h6, rook e7. Queen takes g2. And now let's find the move that Jobava played. Never forget what we're playing for. Now we're playing for an endgame. Queen d2 check. Takes, king takes d2. And after rook a1, there was this move of rook e1, rook a3, b5. And even though this rook seems active, it is kind of cut off from defending and stopping that b, fun, b pawn from running. It's very difficult to stop that b pawn from running. And if you go rook a2, rook b1, and that pawn will march and turn into a lady. So that was one of those typical wins by Jabava, playing very solidly, not going for that deep of complications, however, still playing energetically and looking for the opportunities to use the positional vices. But I feel we didn't see enough of Jobava, so let's look at one more of his games where he faced Ruslan Ponomaryov. So we're looking at this game by Jabava, where he actually will be playing more in the style of uh, Queen's Gambit Decline. So whenever I'm talking about Queen's Gambit Decline, is whenever you see positions like this. C takes, E takes, Knight F3, Knight F6, Bishop G5, and you get into slow maneuvering. Bishop E6, so let's say castles, E3, Bishop E6, Knight D7, and this typical play in the opening. So the rapport Jabava, as it is correctly named, he plays it differently at times with bishop f4, c5. Now he's facing what rapport faced, e3, c takes d4, e takes d4. Again, you don't have knight c6, because the same trick. It's the same deal. a6, bishop d3. So we've seen knight f3 in the original Rapport Sutovsky game. Bishop d3, knight c6. Also, coming back to that side note, so it's kind of fascinating. We're writing 2020 now. However, this whole system by Rapport and Jobava was invented 
only six years ago, so in 2014, and was played by the Rapports, so Rapport and his wife, Jovana, and Jobava, Badur Jobava. So here, this time he makes it up and goes knight e2, which is surprising. Totally different way of playing and more of a slow positional grind. But let's see what's going on. e6, and e6 I don't think is such a great move, because in the French and in any other openings, the big issue, what are you going to do with that c8 bishop? So probably bishop g4 should have been much better. And just activate it and try to exchange it off. Because after e6, that bishop is just staring into nothingness. Queen d2, b5, but this time Jabava is tricking you with the mirage that he's going to castle along. He's actually castling short. Bishop e7. But b4 is still an annoying move, so I'm going to deal with it with a3. Bishop d7, h3, castle. And now we have to decide, and this is one of those important questions in chess that you have to answer. Which rook to activate or where to put them? So let's talk about this a little bit. Where would you put your rook or which one would you put where? In fact, this can decide if you win or lose a game, the placement of your rooks. So here, it's even more important. Well, if you ask me, I would put the rook to d1 and the other rook to e1. The problem is if you go rook a e1, this rook is not doing that much. And f4, f5, even though it looks tempting, to be honest with you, is just very hard to achieve. Noticing that, Jobava actually goes rook f e1 and bringing the other rook to d1. Just remember, you also have a weakness on d4, and because of your knight is on c3, oftentimes the spawn on d4 can get into trouble. So it makes sense to have a rook supporting it from d1. Knight a5, rook d1, queen b6, and again, here I'm going to stop and ask you the big question. All right, we have all of our pieces in a good positions. However, you've got to continue playing the game. You can't just say, stop, I'm good, I'm happy, what's going on in this position? I'm passing. It doesn't work like that in chess. You can't pass. You still got to find a plan. And the way grandmasters find a plan is the following. Which, please, which piece is terrible at the moment? Well, it's the knight on e2. So Jabava was thinking and saying, well, I don't want to put this knight on c1 because it wouldn't do too well on that square. So it goes knight g3. The question is, what is this knight really doing on g3? And that's the one thing that Ponomario was probably wondering, what is that knight actually trying to do? Rook fc8 said, just brought the rook to the c and said, I don't see, I don't know what you really want. So, you know, you tell me. You tell me what you want. However, Ponomaryov is going to be surprised. It's right to move and play. Let's try to find Jobava's brilliant, brilliant move. <clears throat> so whenever you're looking for improbable solutions or tactics, you always have to pinpoint the weakness in this position. And the weakness in this position is this bishop on e7. Now it's covered by these pawns. However, not after knight f5, it's not. Because if you take, then there's rook takes e7. But Ponomari have thought here, okay, I'll take. Takes, bishop e6, 
And after queen d8, I will go all Pac-Man on that rook on e7. And thinking that this will be his day. Just winning the rook and winning a game against Jobava. But it turns out that's not the case. Because Jobava unleashes this unpredictable but brilliant move of bishop h6. Unpredictable but not illogical, mind you. Why? Because the queen, the knight, the rooks are sort of on a vacation on the queen side. And there's not really any pieces left defending the king. And if the king would try to run, well, it wouldn't run for too long, because bishop g7, queen g5 check, and then you lose the knight. Also, your king is awful. Also, if you take this, queen takes h6, let's say knight e8, then there's a beautiful finish. So I don't really want to spoil it for you, dear viewers. I'll give you a little bit of time to find it, because this one is just beautiful. Well, you can go the easy way, but you can also do a cascade of sacrifices. Knight takes d5. You can't take that knight because this long-range piece called the queen is going to take you from h6 all to b6. Queen d8, seemingly defending everything, but not for too long. Boom! Rook takes e8, you've got to take, only move, knight f6, royal fork, but we're not even going to take that lady, because it's mate on h7. A very, very elegant way to finish the game. However, he didn't take and didn't play knight e8. He actually took, but he didn't play knight e8. This is a gorgeous mate, I have to be honest with you. And by the way, bishop h6, again, we are on move 17. So this is a big and quick attacking game by Badur Jobava. gh, queen takes h6, rook takes c3. And here, instead of taking this rook, he says, no, 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 I don't want your rook. Check, king f8, queen takes f6. Rook takes D CD, and here black resigned. However, I'll tell you the reason why. You can't ever go back with the knight, because then you lose the bishop. Your pawn is pinned on f7. And if you don't do that, white is just going to play rook e1. Rook takes e6, regardless of what you do. If you go here, white still doesn't care. Rook takes e6. This is kind of beautiful, with all of those heavy pieces mounting in front of the king. Rook takes e6, and queen takes f7. Checkmate! So that is kind of the reason that Ruslan Ponomaryov resigned on move 21. And probably this is the reason what you see on the board. So that will be it for the Rapport Jabava variation, and I really hope that I gave you a boost to pick it up and appreciate and spread the word that this is the Rapport Jabava variation that you so much love and want to play. Thank you for listening and watching. Take care.